Welcome everybody to our author series this morning with Francesca Arnoldy. I'm so pleased to have her back again. And my name is Susan Barber. I am the community education curator for the programs for the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to be able to do this, to offer these kinds of um, opportunities for people to learn more and engage more um, with issues around death, dying, loss, and grief. This is being recorded. Um, I wanna make sure that that is happening and it is. And for those of you that may be joining us for the first time, I wanna just welcome you all. And if people would like to put up in chat where it is that they're diet, where they are Zooming in from and their names, that would be wonderful too. Cause I know we have people from all over coming to join us for this. Uh, just as an introduction to the foundation, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization inspired by the life of psychiatrist, humanitarian, and hospice pioneer, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Though Elizabeth is often described as the death and dying lady or the creator of the five stages, she often referred to herself as the life and living lady. Elizabeth had a spirit of embracing all of life, which includes death. And we further the mission and vision of Elizabeth through the work of the foundation. Um, the foundation here in the United States consists of some educational programming um, and work that her son Ken Ross is doing. But around the world, the foundation is incredibly strong with chapters in um, probably over, I think, two dozen locations now. There's a capacity compassionate community program at St. Luke's Hospital in Singapore. They've the, the chapter in Guatemala has just recently opened an 18 bed respite center for cancer patients. In Singapore, they run a fellowship program training medical personnel in seven Asian countries, including countries that have no hospice or palliative care information. In Chile, they're initiating the first pediatric hospice. And these programs go on and on and they're developing end of life programming with Stanford University, as well as with Compassion and Choices. So we are very grateful to um, be able to offer these community education programming. And um, I rarely do this, but I was recently on a, on a um, listening to a podcast where at the beginning they just said, this is completely supported by your donations. <laughs> there is no budget for the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. We receive no grant funding, no foundation money from anywhere. It's just the donations of people who join us here. So if anybody has an opportunity to those of you who've donated for this, thank you so much. And for those that can, at the end, I'll put up a, a link to the donation page. And now it is my... Um, great pleasure to introduce Francesca. And I am um, just so grateful. Francesca is a death doula. She's a community doula, a writer, and a fellow mortal. She is the author of three, is it four now, Francesca? You can let us know, but um, I think four books now. Maybe this is your third. She's a published researcher with the Vermont Conversation Lab and the original developer of the End of Life Doula training program at the University of Vermont, which is a fabulous training program. My, her goal is to encourage people to hold one another's hands through life's intensities. She's living in rural Vermont with her family in a most beloved village. And I'm going to let Francesca now, I'm going to bring her down here and spotlight Francesca as well. And I will move out of here and let Francesca introduce herself and. Um, so great to have you again, Francesca. I'm going to mute myself. And for everybody here in the audience for, that's joining us here, please keep yourself muted, Tom. I'm going to mute you. Um, and I will be looking for that and keeping people muted as best of, as I can. Tom, I'm going to mute you again. Please just leave that muted because um, we can hear background noise when it's not. And I'm going to also let people know that there'll be opportunities to raise your hand using me down at the bottom here. Um, under more, many people have a hand raising or under the smiley face. And that is the easiest way for me to track who wants to ask a question and when. So we'll do that. Um, probably we have about an hour. Also put up your questions in chat as Francesca is speaking and I'd be happy to track those. Thank you all so much. And I am muting myself now, Francesca. Thank you, Susan. And hello everyone. It is lovely to be in community with you virtually. Please excuse, I have a little bit of a head cold. So if you hear a little stuffiness or if I have to cough or get a drink of water, we're dealing with um, back to school germ season here and it's going strong. I'm coming to you from Vermont, but I do feel so connected to people more globally, which has been amazing to see 
like-minded people like yourselves who are curious and interested and also dedicated to promoting these types of conversations and events about mortality, about end-of-life planning, and about grief as well. So as Susan mentioned, I consider myself to be a death lit author. So death literacy, as in promoting what it means to be mortal, what it means to be human, what it means to be interdependent on one another and have a need for support, compassionate support and resources and options and also information and also death literacy. So books that have to do with the end of life. My first book is Cultivating the Doula Heart. I have a real beat up version here, Essentials of Compassionate Care, and it's a doula guidebook. It's very concise, very short. <clears throat> I wrote that back in 2018 because as I was creating the end of life doula training program at the University of Vermont, it's really broad, really comprehensive, and I wanted to distill the essentials into a guidebook that's really easy to sort of scan and pull things out of and review and look back upon as needed. And then I published a picture book and I did an author visit for that picture book a couple of years ago, I believe, called Map of Memory Lane. And that book was inspired by a conversation I had with one of my grandmothers many decades ago. And it was really my first big question that I had as a kid asking her about her own mortality and her gentle answer that she responded with. So giving parents, teachers, you know, adults who care for children in any capacity and children themselves, a frame of reference and some language to be able to have difficult conversations and to be able to feel a little bit more prepared. And then my most recent book, which will be the focus of today mostly is The Death Doula's Guide to Living Fully and Dying Prepared. And this is an interactive workbook. So it's it's meatier, it's, it's longer. I cover more. What I did was I really dumped my entire doula bag into its pages. And so it's a workbook, so it's interactive. There is space for writing. There are countless prompts for reflective journaling and then also activities and projects that people can do. So I could talk a little bit more about all of the sections of that book. As we continue on, my main mission with all of these works is to empower people to feel like they have a little bit more confidence as they're potentially facing loss themselves. So anticipatory loss, which was a major focus of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and I'm so thankful for her work in that field, um, or and or when they're supporting other people and caring for other people who are either facing loss, imminent loss, or have experienced loss and are deep in grief. I also want to promote the idea of planning ahead. And so one of the main inspirations for this new book is what I call my death journal, which is sitting across from me in my home office. It, and it's sitting on my bookshelf, which is a casket a beautiful, simple casket made by Fiddlehead Caskets out of um, Canada. And in, for right now, it has bookshelves. And on that, I have my death journal. And my death journal is a scrapbook that I have been creating for my loved ones for many years. They know of its purpose and they know where it lives they know where and when to find it. And it's meant for my end of life. So if that happens to be more expected, we have some time to anticipate the end. I know I'm terminally ill. Then they could turn to my death journal and they could gather up some ideas straight from me about how to provide the kind of care that I would want at that time for myself. If my death happens to occur more unexpectedly, then they know to turn to my death journal during their time of mourning. And it is full of my messages to them. It has poetry, it has quotes, song lyrics, it has individual letters and sort of group letters to my loved ones from me. It has lists in there that reflect who I am, my values, and what I've loved in my own life. So lists 
lists, for example, like comfort is dot, dot, dot. And I have a huge page just jam packed with ideas about what brings me comfort. And again, if they were providing comfort to me at the end of my life, they could turn to that and become inspired by some of these individualized, personalized ideas. Or it could be a, a wonderful walk down memory lane because it's really about the memories from my life. Also related to that would be my happiness is list. And then I have an activity in there about beliefs that, and all of these are included in the new workbook. So when I came up with the idea about beliefs, I actually asked my two children to engage in this activity with me and they're teenagers and they were game, you know, probably with a little moaning and groaning, but they were willing. So we sat down at the table and we each had a note card. And so at the top of the note card, I asked them to put, I believe in, and then I believe that about halfway through. And I said, and then just finish the sentence, whether it's one word, whether it's a long sentence, the, the remainder of it. And so then we just took time quietly to write. And after we were done writing, after a couple minutes, when we felt like we had sort of filled up our note card, we each took a turn sharing aloud what we had written on our belief list. And it was fascinating to kind of, um, you know, these, these young humans that I have known and loved since before they were even alive, you know, um, they, they surprised me. They also affirmed some things that I knew to be true about them. They made me laugh. They made me sigh. It was this beautiful experience that we shared together. And then I, um, and some were very irreverent and just silly and light, like I believe in cheese. And then others were more about their passion for the world. And I believe in love or the strength of humanity and connection or things like that. And so then I glued those note cards in my death journal. So in this death journal, I also have some of my wishes for end of life care and for after my death and including disposition plans and hopes and contingency plans as well. Sort of like, this is my ideal scenario. If that's not possible or manageable for you, here's what I'm okay with. Here's what I'm really hoping to avoid. And, and making sure that they have the information and the instructions that will be helpful for them in that time of great overwhelm, which any of us who have been survivors of a loss and who have had to make decisions or try to follow through on somebody else's um, decisions that they have made for themselves, it's, it's generally complex at best, if not overwhelming. So my aim is to try to lift some of that burden for them in advance with as much effort and love as I can. And also messages about grief and about my hopes for them in their continued living beyond my life. Basically, they'll find me on this page when they're missing me the most. And I've seen through my doula work and through my own personal life, how very meaningful that can be for mourners who are continuing to yearn for that connection with their person. And I've seen people who are so eager to find that one last note, that one last message, those last words from their person. And when they're not there, it, it tends to make people feel like there's something left unsaid and something that feels a little unresolved. So my hope for my loved ones is that I will facilitate their grief in as healthy a way as possible in advance with this work. So Susan, I'm going to pause there and let you kind of jump in and steer from here. No, Francesca, just so much of what you've said, just I don't, after 35 years of like engaging in this end of life kind of work, the thought of your family sitting down at a table with cards that you've created for them to have a conversation that's not like, okay, let's sit down and talk about what I want at the end of my life, but really like, who are we as human beings that are relating to each other in this house every day? And what would happen, like, like what are the qualities or the things that are most important to you that I don't know, but that will really facilitate me caring for you if and when that time comes? Um, 
it's brilliant. And I could imagine as I don't know what your next book project is, but like a book really of these types of like actual pages. I mean, it's just for family life. I have been saying for decades, this work should start in kindergarten. People should be having these conversations, but it's not up to the teachers to do this in families. It's up to families to really start engaging in these conversations very early on. So that is brilliant. And the part about people really wanting something I think I, I shared with you a very dear friend of mine. She's spoken here. She's spoken all over the world about grief and loss. Isabel Stencil Burns died um, in July and left things for everybody in her life. I mean, just she knew for quite some time and spent a long time taking care of these things. And I, you know, I've never been to a service where it, nobody wanted it to end, but that's what was happening this weekend. And she left words for us. She actually wrote a eulogy Um that for anybody that was sitting there and all the thousands of people listening to the it on streaming Facebook Live, there was no doubt about the completeness of her life, should anybody be doubting anything about it. And the recognition that no matter how long I live, there'll never be enough time to do all of the things I want to do. So don't ever feel badly when your life is ending that you didn't have time to do everything because life is sort of designed like this. But to have it such so clear and that this kind of work you're doing uh, just um, provides so many opportunities for people to do that. So death does not come as a shocking surprise in an emergency room with a bunch of strangers, but can be something that is discussed and incorporated in a family life in a beautiful, meaningful way. That also like the answers to those questions is not just about death and dying, it's about how we're gonna to live together as, as people. So thank you for that. Um, I also, also just wanted to ask you, um, could you talk a little bit, you know, like how did you land here? I usually tell people this is not the line I was standing on at career day in high school, <laughs> definitely not. And also, like, can you talk a little bit about why death doula or end of life doula? Because um, I know you also work as a hospice volunteer and as a volunteer coordinator. I re for a long time, I was confused about why are people doing a death doula training when they could be a volunteer and then realizing how restricted so many agencies have for volunteers these days. So maybe just talking about how this, why you're doing this work. Yeah, that's that's funny to think. Yeah, career day. This this wasn't on my top five or 100 or things I had even thought of or things that I knew existed. And we are really continuing to bring these types of roles into existence. And we do have Elizabeth Kubler-Ross to thank for opening this door and shining a light on the treatment that people who are at the end of their lives really need and deserve. And they weren't receiving that very often prior to her work. So Again, very thankful for her efforts always and want to carry forward that intention with my work. So I have found myself here by way of birth doula work. So back when I was pregnant with my second, which was 14, 15 years ago, I trained to become a postpartum doula and then I became a childbirth educator and then a labor and birth doula. And I did that work pretty regularly, part-time, but regularly up for about five or six years and attended 60 something births or so and taught a lot of classes, group classes, individual classes. And it really opened my eyes and my heart to what it means to be of service to somebody during a time that is incredibly mysterious and unfolds very uniquely each time for each person. I mean, sometimes I would companion the same family, the same people, the same couple, the same person through their pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. And even still, it was different every time for the same person. So I loved that and found such profound meaning myself. And this, I mean, it, it just wakes you up to what actually matters in life when you are able to hold somebody's hand through a time like that. And then our family, we began to experience losses ourselves. So it included two of my grandfathers, my father-in-law and our dog within a pretty short period of time all died. And I found myself without any intention or expectation or plan. I found myself naturally shifting into my doula presence during those times and found 
I found comfort in that, being able to lean on some of those approaches and techniques and skills that I had developed. And I also recognized that the people around me found comfort in that. In having somebody there who was willing to see it through, who was able to stay calm and centered as much as possible, who was eager to learn from the experience itself as it was happening, and who was able to assess the needs and the comfort level of people and then step in or step away as needed. And so I learned a lot and it really piqued my interest. And I sort of said to the universe, I would like to explore this more in my life. And then the fates allowed for that to happen. And I got an invitation from a neighbor to develop the end of life doula training program. And that was because we were talking about birth related trainings. And then they received an invitation from Cabot Cheese Company, the co op. And they wanted to put some funds toward community programming that would be beneficial for their farmers and beyond. So I said yes and worked for about a year to develop that curriculum, ran that program for about five years. And then during that and since, have come up with my own workshops that I give on my own sometimes. And then also I'm part of the faculty for the Art of Dying Institute's thanatology program. So I teach for them twice a year, usually speaking at conferences and basically as much as I can promoting and advocating for this type of communication and also for skill building and also for sharing our own stories, both my personal stories and my work stories, so that people have a better understanding. They have a frame of reference for end of life because back to that idea of death literacy, I mean, we don't know what we don't know. And when an experience is shrouded in such mystery, it generally makes us feel anxious because we don't know what to expect. We can't anticipate what's going to happen. And with death, dying, and grief, obviously, we can never completely understand it. We cannot wrap our mortal brains around all that it encompasses. And yet, when we can have a frame of reference, when we can know sort of milestones or what is expected, and we can normalize that, then we can feel like we've got a little bit more confidence to step in and step up and be there for other people without having to feel like we have to know every single answer. We have to be the expert on death because that is not expected and it's not even possible and it's just too much pressure. But we can always ensure that people who are going through that, ourselves included, are not isolated. They're not alone in it. They don't feel neglected. And that's not nothing. That is a really powerful offering when we can step in and step up for other people. So that's kind of my um, trail. In the meantime, I, I did train to become a hospice volunteer. I worked part-time for a little bit as a hospice volunteer coordinator, which was fascinating. And I uh, I expanded my doula private practice to include end-of-life care as well. So as I can, I can't really be on call for people like some doulas can be because of my schedule, because of all the events and things that I have planned. For example, I'm going to Portugal next month for an immersive retreat based off the new book, which I'm thrilled about, and other conferences and events like that. So I can't, I can't in my schedule make myself on call like for vigil, but I do a lot of work with people. Sometimes it's just a one-off. They have something on their task to-do list. You know, they want to update their advanced care plans. And so they may reach out to me for that. They want to write their own obituary. They want to work on some death journaling or some remembrance gifts for their families. They could be at any health status and still reach out and have support like that from me as a doula. Other doulas are able to work with somebody and walk with somebody the entire way through and be on call for their end of life. Um, Right now, I'm working with somebody who's not technically yet eligible for hospice, but who has an incurable condition and has wanted to explore end of life options for herself and to become more informed and put together an end of life care plan for when that time comes. So it really does vary. And I always look at my work as very complementary to what is available. So as part of my work with this particular client in my contract, I have 
people sign off on um, my ability to communicate with their care team if that's beneficial for them. And so I am in regular communication with this client's palliative care doctor who I know and respect and she invites me to speak in her med um, school classes. I'm going again next week. So we have a relationship and I can be her eyes and ears and give her updates about how this person's condition is progressing in between her visits. And so it's another way that my client's needs are being met because it takes the burden off of her and her loved ones to have to try to continue with that communication in between visits and things. So, and I can, um, I mean, I, I hesitate to say advocate because I never want to speak for somebody. Sometimes I'll speak as someone when I'm directly quoting, I'm using their words and I'm sharing what they have told me and what they have said. So I can pass along those messages to the other people on the team who are also taking care of her. So, um, and it, then in addition, I work as a researcher with our head of palliative care in our network. And we've been doing some fascinating research, mostly about story listening. So through the pandemic, I trained up a couple of doulas to become story listening doulas. And we were catching grief stories during the pandemic virtually, which was super powerful during such a time of isolation. And now I'm shifting focus for the next year. My contract will be about running workshops to train people in this story listening intervention. And then also doing um, story listening sessions in person locally at our med school for people in healthcare and for learners, for students as well, going into healthcare and catching their stories because there's so much overwhelm. There's so much stress and, and pressure that people are feeling and also to give them a chance to celebrate their work and their stories. So that's kind of a long-winded answer. Who I am, what I do, and how I got here. Could you say a little bit, Francesca, I think about what families, like when you're, when you are supporting a family, can you say more about, um, and we will go back to the story listening, Sally, I'll come back to that, but could you say something about what are the things that you think that would be most beneficial um, for people to understand prior to being at the bedside, caring for somebody that they love really dearly? Like what are the things that you find maybe consistently that people would benefit from understanding about this process? It's a great question. Yeah. I do think that, so I have had good luck, you know, I've had good fortune of, of being able to, sometimes what I do is I, I'm a myth buster a little bit mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people have misunderstandings and they might not know, for example, what hospice can offer to them. And they have this idea of hospice in their mind and they have this idea or they've heard this messaging about that's giving up and that's the very end, that's it, that's throwing in the towel. And so I can work with people and generally convince them, not because I'm pressuring, but just because I'm giving them the honest you know, truth of it, how much benefit they will be able to receive by accepting mm -hmm. that kind of care into their life and that their quality of life for most people generally improves. Length of life actually often improves for people. And so it doesn't mean giving up at all. It means kind of taking off some of that stress and burden from family who have been trying to scramble to put together a care plan and get all the resources and equipment and medications and things that are needed, you have somebody who's actually coordinating all of that for you. So I do think that that helps. I do think that having someone like a doula or like a hospice care provider, or even a hospice volunteer who is outside of their sphere and who hasn't been involved in the family dynamics any relationship dynamics is not sort of like in the thick of it can feel like a really safe person to have initial conversations with so sometimes we try to protect each other from how we're really feeling or from the actual reality that we're experiencing we're trying to spare their feelings and avoid those difficult conversations and when you have a someone like a doula who's there for a visit who's sitting bedside it feels a little safer to be able to actually express your fears or say, you know, actually, I am so tired of the appointments that I've had to go to. I'm so tired of these medications and the side effects that I'm done. I want to have a little bit of comfort in the time that I have left. 
And so it might be the first time that they're able to actually voice something. And then from there, they're like, okay, whew, I actually said it. I got that off my chest. I was able to kind of process that aloud and come to some sort of clarity. And then the second step, they would probably be more apt to have those conversations then together. Sometimes, you know, somewhat facilitated by or a doula might hold this space for people who are having, who are sharing that sort of truth and honesty with their loved ones, but not necessarily. Sometimes it's like a doula could be the practice run, and that's really beneficial and helpful for people. A doula might also recognize that somebody is feeling very stressed out or anxious as they come for a visit. So, you know, I might ask someone, do you want to go get a little fresh air with me? Do you want to go take a walk? Do you want to have a cup of tea? And I can be a listening ear for that person as well, because people are carrying in so much that might go unexpressed and might not even be really known to them until they sort it through. And so I could be a sounding board. So that's really helpful. I, I always try to make sure that my pacing and what I'm offering is matching the pacing of the person. So, you know, people, it's not uncommon for people to kind of take one step forward, two steps back. Sometimes they'll take two steps forward, one step back from the actual reality of their mortality or of their impending death. And that is completely natural. And we need to be really sensitive about that. It's a protective mechanism psychologically. If we just were to force ourselves into that stark reality, it would probably break us, you know, mentally, psychologically, um, in our soul. It, it would have detrimental effects. So a doula is definitely not going to shove somebody into, you know, clarifying their plans and things, but we leave an open door and we plant seeds. And we create the kind of relationship where people know that they can trust us and they know that they can broach conversations where I'm not going to turn away from them. I'm going to turn toward that intensity, that suffering. I'm going to sit tight, maybe use silence to be invitational about it, or even say to them, you know, do you want to tell me some more about that? That sounds really important to you. Whereas sometimes other people would shy away. And they wouldn't want to see their person suffering. So they might say things like, well, at least this, or you should do that. And they're well-intentioned, but they're not allowing the person to really go to the depth that they need to kind of unearth their own best path forward. And so as a doula, I try to maintain that kind of courage in the face of, I'm, I'm not going to have their answers. I'm not going to have all the answers but I'm going to companion them through that exploration. Yes, my teacher and friend and mentor, Stephen Levine would often say, we need to stop shooting on ourselves and on the people around us. <laughs> and trying to remove that word from the vocabulary is so difficult, especially I find, you know, especially for um, people who are trained in end of life care and just are so eager to share what's been important to them and what they've learned with people who are going through this, maybe most people go that, that we can remember, go through the dying process once. And so, you know, if somebody's had some experience, their desire to share also from a very well-meaning place can really not work for the person who's dying, who's really trying to come to terms with what works for them. I find this, I find this in my own family, I experienced this. And um, I'm curious, like when you're working with families where there's lots of different ideas and maybe people have prepared for this, but without a conversation as a family. So as they, what is it? The daughter, the daughter from the other coast flies in and has all these ideas. And there's like people that have been caring for the loved one. Of, like, do you think we never thought of these things? Or I'm curious how you work with this when there's different ideas about what should be happening in the family and for the person who's ill and dying. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's much easier than it is for the people who are directly involved. So I can become a person and a receiver of, okay, this person's flying in, wants, and I'm trying to assess like what's underneath this message. So probably it sounds to me like, really wants to be involved, wants what's best for their parent, and wants to alleviate some suffering, wants to make sure that the family feels connected and well cared for. So I try to look for what's under it, and then I can validate that. Mm -hmm. I can always kind of go to that. 
Mm-hmm. And then I can say to them, you know, I think that it, the rest of your family, they're feeling pretty overwhelmed as is, and it's been an exhausting journey as they've been providing so much care. So let's, you know, you and me, we can kind of talk through your ideas and we can see how they might fit into the picture. And, and I do love creative ideas and I love creative energy, but I understand how that could be received as either complaining or that um, the rest of the family hasn't been doing enough yet. And and so recognizing on both ends, you know, how it's being said, but what's really underneath it and how it might be received. And so how to try to bridge that communication so that everyone's needs are being seen and met. It takes, it's, you know, it takes some grace and uh, it's a balancing act, but I don't have my ego wrapped up in it. So it's much Mm -hmm. easier for me to remain neutral and be a listening ear and sort of try to reword what I'm hearing back to them. And sometimes that's all that's needed, but sometimes people really do want to know what can I do? And during a time, especially during active dying, when there's not a whole lot left to do, it's more about being than doing that can feel very uncomfortable for people. I will Mm. say it's very similar with birth. Yeah. Someone who is in the final stage of pushing, who is encouraged to listen to their body and work with their body's urges and naturally just work with that. There, I've seen it, I've seen it midwives, OBs, you know, um, grandmothers, partners, friends who are there, whoever, a variety of people. Some people are able to sort of sit on their hands and and watch and witness and encourage that sort of tuning in to what's needed and what's going to be most beneficial. Other people, because of, I don't know, because they just don't trust the process as much because they can't sit in silence because they have to feel like they're just doing something. And it usually comes from, they want to see the person to the other side. This liminal space, this place in the middle is really difficult to sit in. I just want to get to the other side. So they're like throwing ideas. They're being very directive, they're saying, this is what you need to do. And it's a much different approach. So I I do keep that in mind at end of life as well, because I see that. I see that when people are waiting for news, you know, maybe they've gone in, they've gotten a scan, they've gotten a new test or something, they're waiting for the news. That can be a really difficult time of liminal space. Also during active dying as well just sort of knowing that the the time is running short and having to sit on your hands more than feels comfortable. So it it is great if you do have some ideas about some self-care or creating an atmosphere around the person. People, some people like jobs. They like to feel like they are being useful and helpful. So, you know, asking somebody to think about the music that's being played and what might be most comforting to this person or the scent in the air and what might be most comforting um, or to share stories, treasured memories and reminding them that perhaps their person might be listening and that could be really comforting for them. So, excuse me, as a doula, sometimes I'm just, I'm in there and I'm, I'm the uh, primary support and sometimes I'm much more of a secondary support and I'm giving ideas for people to consider. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not being directive myself, but I'm just feeding them some ideas to consider. Like you might try this, or maybe your person would appreciate that. And then that way they feel like they're still involved, but they're not, um, but they're in their comfort zone still. I love Sally posted up here, Sally Shannon, who works with um, Final Passages um, and Jerry Grace Lyons posted, we are a nation of doers. And I find that so true. I think myself included, you know, being at the bedside in that liminal space where somebody's um, going through the process of getting out of that body. And I think for you, as you know, like getting into this world is hard. Very rarely does a lady pop a baby out with like, oh, that was great. You know, now I'm going to go out to dinner. Like that just doesn't happen. It's hard to get here. And it's also hard to get out of the body I have found. And so that space where the person is maybe agonally breathing, having some chain stokes, the breathing is off. It's not or different than it normally is. 
Um, the doing you other than opening the windows and closing the windows or adjusting the fan or any of those things, you know, I think sitting with that, because it really, that's sort of the, um, you're sort of at the fulcrum point of helplessness and feeling helpless. Like I can't do anything right now without giving any value to the incredible benefit that people seem to have from having a loving presence at the bedside and somebody who can just, you know, if I, for the volunteers I've worked with, I really encourage them in whatever way this makes sense to drop out of their head because they're thinking, they're overthinking this and into their heart and really try to connect from that perspective because all the doing is done. At that point, when somebody's transitioning, there's nothing we can do but provide a loving presence. There's, They're doing all the hard work. It's like you can't jump into somebody when they're delivering a baby to make it easier for them. You also can't jump into somebody's death process Um you can support it, make sure medication symptoms are well managed. But how have you, you know, maybe you have a natural, maybe it was a natural tendency for you, but how have you cultivated that place of being silent or quiet at the bedside um, and just being still enough for the process that's happening in front of you to go or continue? I, I think partly it is, a natural inclination and partly it is a practice that has proven itself to be really effective because when I've tried to do more than be or tried to fix or problem solve or give my advice it generally backfires it generally mm -hmm. isn't what is actually needed yeah. it interrupts somebody's natural process and so through so many you know, times in my life, whether it's when I've been acting in the capacity of a doula or as a parent or as a daughter, I have fumbled my way through to finding that to always, that's my default now, that's my go-to. And being present, being calm, being attentive is something and it's really valuable for that person. But what I try to do is really cultivate a lot of trust in the other person in their inner strength and their wisdom. And then I try to create the conditions, just you know, imagining myself doing that. And because of, of my presence and because of my willingness to seek out resources and ideas as needed, I try to create the conditions where they will be able to find their best way forward and they will be able to tune into that inner voice and their inner truth. And if I can hold the faith in that, then they're going to be more apt to find it and hold it for themselves as well. Versus if I'm panicking and escalating things or trying to tell them what they should do or what I would do, that's really, it always ends up being an interruption. And sometimes it ends up being a shame spiral for the other person, because if that doesn't match, if that's not in alignment, then they will potentially feel like they're disappointing me and yeah. themselves because it didn't work or it's not right or that's not what they're going to do or they tried to do something else and it failed or whatever it is it can create more actual shame in them yeah. than if I'm holding that belief and trust in their process and knowing that it's different than mine and that that's okay they're going to have a different path than I imagine I would for myself potentially mm -hmm. yeah that's beautiful thank you um I'm wondering if you want to read anything from your book, if there's any passages in there that you think might be useful. I'm also thinking about if, um, you know, if dying prepared, if you were to tell like our audience, like what are the top three things that you feel like would be beneficial for them or their family in terms of dying prepared? And we have people here from all over the world, as it turns out today. And so I know cultures and practices, religious traditions, all would have different ideas about this. Um, and human beings, I find sort of, regardless of those structures in their life and those beliefs, even deeply held beliefs, that showing up at the bedside and feeling prepared for that experience um, often doesn't come about just because you have a deep faith or a deep belief or a um, or you've done this before with somebody else, or you've read about it in the same way you can't learn to swim by reading a book. You have to actually get in that water. So what would, what have you found um, 
three tips or three things that you find mostly at the bedside where you feel like people, oh, they wish they had done this and now they're at the death and they haven't. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. about that. Okay, the first that comes to mind is I think as a gentle entry point, thinking about during times in your own life when you have been faced with a challenge, when you haven't felt well physically, when you have been recovering from an illness or experiencing an illness or recovering from a surgery or a broken bone, something like that, thinking about those times, what did you find beneficial? What worked for you in terms of support? So in terms of you know, verbal support, what kinds of words and messages and encouragement landed well with you, and also what what types of practical offerings. That can tell you a lot about yourself and your needs in terms of um, your privacy, in terms of the language that you're hoping for, in terms of, you know, how much or how little involvement you would prefer from other people. Yes. I think that that is a way that someone could begin to imagine themselves needing care without having to try to visualize their deathbed, which for some people is just too overwhelming or um, they can't wrap their heads around that. It's just, it's too theoretical. So I think that that is an important activity for people to sort of start with. I think that I would highly encourage on a much deeper level for people to think about, you know, what regrets are you carrying around? What is heavy in your heart? What conversations do you wish you have had or could have had or could still have? Those points of inquiry like really do, when you explore them, when you do that work of processing, when you attempt to heal, even if those direct conversations can't happen or um, when you've been wronged by someone, when you have trauma that you have experienced by somebody working through that as much as you can, as much as you're willing to, not forcefully, but with really compassionate support and at your own pacing, working through unburdening yourself and healing can really alleviate some of the, I don't know how to term it, like it's almost an anchor to this lifetime, to this world when there's a lot that feels unresolved in people's lives. That's what it seems to manifest as at the end. So as much of that work as possible. And then on the flip side of that, because, you know, we always have to hold both is like finding joy and what does it mean to you to live fully and to be mm -hmm. exuberant and to feel passion in life and what makes you smile, like what makes you howl in laughter and being able to also introduce that and celebrate that as well, I think is, is important. So at the end of life, you know, you're still you, you're still human you're still allowed to be all facets of you. And a lot of that will come to the surface. So make sure that you're able to take time to laugh and be silly and have fun. And it doesn't have to be totally serious and you don't have to have every moment like, oh, this has got to count as the most profound thing I've ever said or done. You're being human the whole way through and everything that makes you, you know, messy and, and brilliant and yourself as human. So those three come to mind for me. Thank you. Those are beautiful, beautiful contemplations for us. I remember a friend of mine, um, one of my first friends who died, um, we, he was in the hospital with AIDS during the late eighties, early nineties. And he had a great sense of humor. That was one of the things that we loved most about each other is our sense of humor. And I remember we were in his room one day laughing our heads off and he was like, oh, we should stop. I'm like, why should we stop? He said, because well, I'm dying of AIDS and that should be a terrible thing. And I was like, honey, there's going to be lots of opportunities for terrible things to happen down the road here. But like right in this moment, this is a great day. And we just, you know, acknowledging that during dying, like for people where Yuma is an important thing that there's going to be, you know, that's going to show up and it might feel really disjointed because like I'm attending the death of my beloved person and we're laughing our, you know, we're just laughing hysterically. And I have to say the nurses would come down to our room and hang out with us because on their breaks, they were like, this is the only room where people are like sort of relaxed and enjoying that they're actually still alive, even though we're in the hospital, we get all, but they're still alive. And um, it's just a joy. They'd come in and eat their, our lunch and we kind of like have this hilarious exchange with them. So um, I think, and that's something that I've realized is super important for me at the end of my life. I, as much as I want people with wisdom and 
I want a sense of humor also. So really spending time engaging with what's important and what you want. Thank you so much for that. Um, earlier, somebody asked about, could you talk a little bit more about um, like normalizing death and what, how do you see that or what do you, um, how, what, how would that look? Like, how would that look in a family, maybe in our communities if death was normalized? Yeah, that's a, it's a layered question. So I want to acknowledge that sometimes death is very unexpected, that death can be very traumatic, that when death comes as a result of an accident or an injury, you know, that's a, a different, that's a subset of death that requires a different sort of conversation. And we always have to hold that that is part of death, that that is a potential. And that is how sometimes people are faced with the death of those that they love or have been connected to. And so we need to acknowledge that and have difficult, complex, layered conversations about those sorts of more shocking, unexpected deaths and that inevitably death will come for us all and that we are mortal. So in the new book, I do go through in quite a bit of detail. I have a whole section about preparedness and opening to death wellness. I mean, I do talk about, like I put out the caveat that sometimes death doesn't feel positive. It doesn't feel like it's at the end of a life well-lived, a long life and the different um, complicating factors and how that can affect grief. I do put that acknowledgement in there. But I also talk about death anxiety and normalizing what that is, kind of naming it, looking into it, looking into the theoretical background, the psychology involved, and also how would we potentially work with that kind of anxiety, which is very natural to come up, sometimes overwhelmingly so, and sometimes just during moments, you know, sometimes we might feel curious about death, and other times we might feel tired by life and almost seeking the comfort that we may find in death and mm -hmm. how to work with that and when to seek support there. And then anything in between, you know, it could be that we have a strong faith or we have these strong ideas and beliefs about what death is, or it might be the other end that, you know, we have no idea and we're sort of wide open to learning. And we know that death itself is going to be the only potential place and time that we receive that kind of clarity in our answers. And so allowing for all of those thoughts to be, you know, just bouncing around in our minds and writing about it, reflecting about it, hopefully ideally communicating with other people about it, and then also working with that in terms of impermanence practices and activities. Thinking about memento mori is something that I encourage people to consider. So like my bookshelf is a casket. It's a visual reminder to me that my life won't last forever. That right now, this is a casket that's a bookshelf and it's full of all these mementos of my life and what has brought meaning and happiness and joy to me, like um, certain books and gifts from people, photographs of those that have died or are living and that I'm connected to. It has things that I have given to loved ones who are facing their death. And then I have received back after their death, and unless sometimes they carry them with them into their final casket or wherever they're for their disposition. Um, but reminding myself like this life won't last forever, but I have today, I have right now, I'm alive at this moment. So how do I want to use my time? And what do I need to attend to that might feel undiscovered or unresolved right now? What can I do in terms of my own personal growth and healing in my relationships and finding a sense of purpose in the life that I am living and in the time that I do have left? So there's a lot there to unpack. There's a lot to work on. And there's so much, I feel like, globally. I mean, some cultures, some places do this better than here in terms of having more honest conversations, in terms of utilizing ritual and ceremony to be able to embrace this part of life and work with it in a more healthy way, in a more connected mm -hmm. way. So, but there's a lot of work to do for us individually and at large. Yes, I feel sad that I would be employed doing community education around death, dying, loss, and grief for the rest of my life if I wanted to. But doing it for 35 years and finding us like still here, it's so interesting to see how this 
particular topic, even though it is the only thing other than birth that we all have in common, is still something that most people never speak about really with friends or family. So I'm so grateful that the doula movement has happened, that people are bringing these kind of communities together online has made it a lot easier. Um, but just that we are still talking about normalizing death, like 50 years after Elizabeth <laughs> started the conversation. There were a couple of people that were interested um, to hear more about story listening and how Tell to talk a little bit about what that actually is and if people could do that with friends or with loved ones or while they're ill or actually even before they're ill and collect mm -hmm. stories. So could you say something about that and how that works with the work you're doing? Yeah, I would point people to the last published paper that came out, which I am the um, first author on mm -hmm. it and it's our protocol paper for story listening so i want to say i don't know if susan if you're willing to do a google search with my name and story i'm doing listening it already and yes. protocol okay yeah if you could drop that link people who i think that it's an open access paper i believe it's the story and, list yes i'll post it right now i've just found it here okay great so that gives a pretty good overview of the training of the approach and gives you a little bit of an insight into the sessions. So that is, that's the Vermont Conversation Lab and that's our, our page there. I don't know if we have our published papers listed in there, but um, that would be a great resource for people. I am thinking, so my mm -hmm. next book that I'm imagining writing would be a guidebook about story listening. And, and I have been kind of working away through some of my journals and things to write up uh, a guidebook about story listening because I have learned a lot about it in terms of my own need to be really careful with and very mindful about shifting into these sessions, about shifting out of these sessions and to work with moments that I feel activated so, you know, as a more gentle term than triggered by what other people have experienced in these very heightened emotional conversations that generally can involve crying and sobbing, lamenting, anger, you know, bitterness, regret. I mean, there's a lot of intense emotion that can come out. So I've had to do a lot of my own self-work about how do I become this sort of supportive presence that's going to be beneficial for the person versus, um, you know, escalate things more. And so it's, it's a very, it's a very defined approach. It's not mental health counseling. You know, it's um, th these story listening sessions that we've been conducting are, it's a one-time mm -hmm. intervention, but there are a lot of skills involved with this style of story listening that can be translated to conversations with friends and family members. And what they do is they, it will protect your own energy and wellness and promote the energy and wellness of the person who's sharing with you, which I think is key to this. So sounds... I can do a quick search too for that specific. Oh yeah. I put that study. up. But, um... I think that you found our lab, which is great. Oh, it's not, it wasn't the actual okay yeah that's hard to do during you're correct I did find this but the study oh it says uh, okay I found it okay thank you yeah so yeah. this gives a little bit more let me just pop back over and I'll put it in the chat thank you and I will um use both of these links then this the lab and the link to the study link to study Ah, perfect. Let me pull this up and I'll, because when we send out the recording for this, which I'm hoping is in the next day or so, um, I will be um, including these resources for you in the email that comes with the recording. So yeah, thank you. You are, this is really great to have. Um, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking about the training that we just completed at the um, California Medical Facility, which is a hospice, a, a pre-existing hospice in a prison here in California, because we were testing out some of the material that we had put together. And the quality that came back most often from the guys that we trained was our ability to listen to their stories. And I'm really curious, you know, this 
ability to listen and develop this quality. Um, for me personally, this is like the, the number one thing for me to continue working on. And I just could imagine the story listening for people who are incarcerated who never get to tell their story would be a remarkably healing experience. So I'm um, making a note of this also for us. Love least. that. I, I love that. I mean, we're trying to imagine our next steps, like our next iterations of story listening. And that's a beautiful option to consider. If you want to hear some remarkable stories from people who are not allowed to speak about what their life has been, then this is the place to go. I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also curious, like in terms of what um, has been most useful for you in this journey to being at the bedside and to being a deaf literacy educator, if there's a couple of things that have been most useful for you, I would imagine that there's a number of people here that are interested in this work, both as somebody who's going to be ill or is ill and will eventually die, but also for people that are thinking about how could I support somebody else, but first I have to have the supports I need, internal supports or develop, you know, maybe some qualities or what's been useful for you along that. And I would always tell people, don't wait until things are perfect, just show up and you'll learn this yes. at the side for sure. But I know there's other people that might have the desire to just, they're working professionally or they want to know what qualities have been most useful for you to develop here in this work. I mean, for me, writing has been very cathartic and that's personal and it might not be everybody's go-to mode of coming to clarity. And But for me, writing has been really important in my journey. Writing for the sake of my own understanding of what I have gone through, my own losses, my own fears, grappling with my own mortality, and writing in the sense of like my death journal, creating that legacy gift, that remembrance project that's ongoing until it's no longer for my loved ones have been really helpful. And then writing in ways that I could hopefully offer other people tools and approaches and language and techniques that they could use and find beneficial. So that's been really important to me. And taking very good care of myself, recognizing that I don't always have adequate capacity or bandwidth to take something on. And I have to be honest with myself and I have to be able to kind of take a step back when needed so that I can be fully myself in my own roles. For example, if I'm going through a personal loss or if a past loss is reemerging for some reason, I know I need to attend to that in order to regain that kind of capacity where I could care for other people. And I think for everyone that's going to look different and how do you get yourself to a place of, you know, your own healing and what you're going to need, having a care plan, you know, having those resources available to you. I go out into nature a lot. That's really useful for me walking when I feel stuck and, you know, turning away from sometimes writing or the page. If I feel like I'm not getting anywhere, that's very useful for me, but also that sense of enoughness and that fear that we will sometimes carry in and we're wondering, you know, that imposter syndrome, are we ready enough? Are we healed enough? Are we prepared enough? Are we knowledgeable enough? Are we experienced enough? You know, you will never feel completely enough, completely ready. This is human work and we were built and made to do this work. So I think so long as you are willing to continue with your own personal growth, healing, self-work, you can do that alongside offering to other people the kind of compassionate care and support that they need and having that clarity between the two, you know, what is mine? What am I working on? What do I need? And, and then being able to distinguish that as separate from who is this person and what do they need and what can I offer to them is vital in both directions. Um, so I will come back to the question I asked earlier. Would you have any, um, is there anything that you'd like to read from your book to us that? Um, oh, I lost sight of that. Yes. Hmm. Thank you, Penny. Wonderful. Yes. And some people are commenting about the frontline show about women in prison. Yes. I, that has been something that is on my list of things to read, to see. Thank hmm. you. Powerful. Yeah. 
Okay, I will read a short section in the impermanence chapter, and it's about the art of goodbye. Years ago, my family started a tradition of marking significant endings and beginnings with blessing stones. When our sweet dog Bella died, we all took part in her farewell. My kids were quite young, and I wanted to make sure they were involved in ways that felt okay. First, we each set off to find a special gift from nature, often a stone, but it could be a pine cone, flower, leaf, or anything else. And then we gathered around the grave my husband had dug on the edge of our yard. We took turns holding our simple gift in outstretched hands while filling it up with memories, words of thanks, and wishes for Bella. We dropped in our blessing stones along with some tears. It was a simply orchestrated way to process and heal. All right, I'll stop there. So um, that was something that sort of evolved quite organically and naturally, and we have gone on to utilize that blessing stone ceremony either for beginnings, like when we were building our home, we came to the place where they had dug out the basement and we found blessing stones and we held them with all of our hopes and wishes for our home and for our years that we would spend here together. And we dropped in our blessings then, or sometimes when we're ending something that has felt very meaningful or fun and it's hard to let it go, it's hard to say goodbye, it's hard to face that ending we will often do a blessing stone ceremony. And I have to say that very recently, I went to visit, we went to visit my in-laws and we were there and had a long weekend and it was really lovely. And I saw one of my teenagers and I, I'll just say they, them, and I won't give any distinguishing features about them because this is personal to them. But I watched as one of my teenagers picked up a stone as we were saying our goodbyes and sort of held it for a minute didn't didn't close their eyes, but was sort of lost in thought. And then I watched as they tossed it into the woods. And I thought to myself, oh, that was a blessing stone ceremony that was done privately, you know, silently within themselves. And um, they were able to lean on that, which I thought was just amazing to see and sort of mark that goodbye and that ending. Yeah, I think that this, you know, it kind of touches back on what you were talking about in terms of what you did for yourself earlier and how when we're working in this space, like really our, you know, our job in a lot of ways is to model what it is that we are hopeful for, right, for others. And to see your um, child go up and do that just spontaneously after being modeled that that is a way, a ritualized way to express a difficult emotion. What a gift that they have that. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful. I have um, another question somebody asked earlier is they um, refer to themselves as a solo ager. I know that there are hundreds, thousands of us out there in the world without mm -hmm. um, children or a spouse or a partner. And I'm curious how you work with people or what you might suggest if anything, uh, for people in that kind of a, a situation. Yeah, I think it's so great that people are thinking ahead and trying to be intentional about their planning in advance so that they don't end up with an outcome that doesn't feel good for them, that doesn't feel right for them. Now, sometimes people who are solo agers will be able to identify an agent, a healthcare agent or a surrogate, someone who a trusted friend or neighbor someone who is willing to sort of step up when needed or if needed, if there's a time when you can not verbalize your own wishes. Having things documented is really vital in order to communicate that, you know, if and when you cannot communicate it yourself, even if you have an agent. So both layers are great, but not everybody has an agent. Even people who are not solo agers might not have somebody in their life who they can trust to actually follow through mm -hmm. with their voiced wishes. So I always point out though, with things like death journaling, that it doesn't have to become a legacy gift. It doesn't have to become a remembrance project in order to be valuable. So there are people who want to do life reviews, who want to reminisce, who want to share stories, who want to look back on their years. And maybe we don't even capture them in lasting form. Maybe we do because it might become a beautiful scrapbook for that person to continue to look through or a library of recordings that they might be able to enjoy. And because 
you know, sometimes things change. Sometimes someone will come into your life unexpectedly and you might create this new relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, things can shift and sway in any direction at any time. But I do think that finding the, the courage to kind of work through some of this, even in good health, especially in good health, mm -hmm. ideally in good health, you know, if that's possible, is a great way to set yourself up for the kind of future and outcome that you would be hoping for. And that I believe is especially important for solo agers. And um, and so I, I give people a lot of credit for being able to do that early and for reaching out to somebody like a doula. And you, it may not be that you are facing the end, but that you want to start doing some of this end of life planning in advance. And then you might maintain that connection and kind of check in on occasion. And if at some point in the future you need or um, a different level of services, then you assess it at that point. Thank you. Um, Sally Shannon has her hand up. So I'm going to do this. Sally, I'm going to drop you down here into the spotlight area. And why don't you go ahead and ask Francesca what your question is? Oh, thanks. Thank you so much for Francesca, for your generosity this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And um I was a solo ager for a very long time and um, love came into my life late in life as you suggested it might. But as I'm listening and thinking about this conversation, there there's so much, there's so many stories and so much that if it just resides with that person um, is lost. And I'm wondering if there are ways that through various communities, there are so many children who don't have exposure to elders and ancestors and community like that. And I'm I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can make a match between those two groups. Any thoughts from anybody? Love that idea. And I think you would be a brilliant poster person for that, Sally. I think it what comes to mind for me is something like StoryCorps which I love listening to StoryCorps stories. And sometimes you have people who don't know each other that come together for story sessions. They've done sort of special editions of this. And then often it's people who do know each other. So I think like pitch that to StoryCorps. That's brilliant. People are going to love that. Have an elder, you know, an, an yeah. aging person and then have a younger person who is interested in learning from someone of a different generation put them together in a story core booth and let the magic happen. Love it. Yes. And Patrick, let me get Sally. Let me just see here. Sally, I'm going to invite Patrick down here with his question. Come on down, Patrick, where are Okay, there we go. Now I can. Oh, this is interesting. It's not letting me move you down here. There we go. Sorry about that. Thank you, Patrick. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi there, Francesco. Thank you for who you are. Um, I've been involved in the hospice world for you know close to forty years before it was even funded, and. Uh, uh, it's just been a, a very interesting uh, and surprising life. Uh, I, I wasn't a kid who thought I'd be doing death and dying work, but one of the things that uh, has been really, really important uh, to me, and you know, I've done this for so long, but it's still important. It's just as important. It will be just as important today as it was 40 years ago, which is, no matter how much I know, uh, how wrong fixing and trying to heal and, and, and you know, bright side stuff is for people, I still am drawn to that. Oh my God, let me just help you. Let me just fix this for you. And so my, my process um, is uh, to always sort of take a, a very unnoticeable, quiet breath and just check in with myself. Where, where's my anxiousness? 
um, you know, wh where, where, where am I having some feelings that's going to impact and disallow me from being fully present with, uh, with someone Ye yesterday, I was in, um, one of my person's home and she uh, was sitting at a card table playing solitaire with regular cards, not online. And all of a sudden I was back to my mom who, who played solitaire every day and love solitaire and wow i was just like so thrown back and so like surprisingly overwhelmed with grief about her and so i just felt my mother i felt her so deeply i missed her so terribly and i just took a breath and uh and just released her with gratitude and then you know i could have my mind into it in, into the person right in front of me and uh but to be able to check in first uh has really helped me not to try and fix another person or uh his or her uh reality about anything um and so i i have a comment but i, I want your feedback or or you know the question is what do you think about that? But I will also say that uh, starting in 1994, um, because I, I, you know, I'm a person like lots of people who are like, I want to do something, you know, or even I want to be something, you know, something, and and to be able to let go. One of the one of the things I've done for since '94 is I bring flowers into a visit and i couldn't afford that myself but i reached out partnered with local florists who have flowers that aren't you know top notch they can't get top dollar for them and so they're just going to throw them away and i said hey these look great rather than just throw them away they have a shorter lifespan but uh could i have them uh, because I've got hospice patients that haven't gotten flowers in, in years. May, uh, may, may, I, may I take that, um, those flowers to them? And somehow without me saying or doing anything, it's like, here's a flower. <laughs> and I don't, have, I don't have to say anything. No words have to come out of my mouth. Uh, and that somehow, I don't, I don't understand the mystery quite a bit or the magic, but I know it's mystery. I know it's magic. And I know somehow I'm a participant in the magic. Uh, so that's what do you beautiful. Think? Thank you so much, Patrick. I have to say what I admire so much is that even after, did you say 40 years Yes. in the field that you have not lost touch with your own humanity that's amazing i vowed for myself even early on i saw really hard shelled people uh, nurses social workers uh, that just had somehow gotten hard to things and I, and I took a vow then and i take promises very seriously even small little commitments or promises i said you know if i ever get to feeling that way just hard shelled and having somebody else's pain not affect me in any way that i'm out i'm i'm gone i'm, I'm not gonna do this any longer and it's it's never happened i've ne i've never <laughs> i've never felt like oh i need to stop now because i can't feel anyone's pain i i feel feel more of their pain and thankfully, am, uh, am able to take that in, embrace that, witness that, hold their story, and let go of it, um, too. So, I mean, it's too, too much loss, too great a burden for me to just have it pile on my shoulders. I, I, I'd break. I know I would. I, I can't do that. So I've had to find a way to to release um, their pain and my pain, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and without being able to do that, 
we would either become so overwhelmed and overburdened that we would sink or we would put up that protective wall, that hard shell. It would be one or the other. So recognizing when things are happening. And like you said, I mean, one tip that I offer to people is remembering the acronym WAIT. And so asking yourself that pause, that breath, why am I talking? So just wait for a second and, and like asking that. yourself, why am I talking? Is it because I'm really uncomfortable with silence <laughs> and I'm having a hard time sitting with the silence? Is it because I want to rescue and I'm uncomfortable with this person's intensity or their suffering in front of me? And, and that pause, that breath, that wait can usually allow us to create a little bit more spaciousness and a little bit more trust to allow the other person to take the next step. And it's not that we can't offer ideas or resources, we can. And even if we don't have them offhand, we could say, I really wanna look into this. We just have to be mindful with how they're presented. So it's not saying I have your answer, here's what you need to do. It's here's, here's what somebody else has found useful or beneficial that you might consider. And sometimes it's simply listening and it's being silent and it's allowing the person wrestle with whatever they're struggling with and making sure that they don't feel alone at that moment. And that is not nothing. That's not nothing. Not nothing. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. As always, your questions are beautiful. Uh, that just reminded me so much that um, letting go of the stories and I have found that that is that that's skill, being able to deeply listen and really take something in and then just as skillfully let it go because it's not ours to carry, really. It's the, um, you know, that was very confusing for me for a long time because I thought that really what um, was important was carrying the story around. What was really important was receiving the story in a way that allowed the person to express it as fully as they needed to. And the burden, this is another you know, thing we talked about at the prison when we were training the men on end of life care, that these are people that they've lived with for 30 or 40 years, some of them that they'll be caring for. And the burden of keeping their stories really will like sink them, they'll drown in all of those stories. And this letting go, this ability to practice letting go so that at our deathbed is not when we start practicing letting go. Um, is just a beautiful practice and a very hard one to remember. And I love weight. We also did introduce weight um, at our training. <laughs> um, weight heard, works. It does. Weight and works. then for me, shifting out. So some of these story listening sessions during the pandemic, especially, I mean, it was an emotional time for all of us, myself included. And I noticed that I was very well versed in shifting in and kind of yeah. embodying the sort of presence that I knew was facilitating my own energy and was beneficial hopefully to the person who was going to be telling the story but then shifting out I ended up starting to do this for me it's sometimes physical I grew up dancing and so a physical practice is sometimes useful for me and I and I found myself doing this rain mm. movement after and it was really reminding myself that like okay that was really intense but just like a storm I'm going to let it wash over me whatever remains is, is mine to keep in terms of my own learning, my own healing, my own growth. Everything else is the other person's. I'm just going to let it like flood over me, wash over me and be gone. And I needed to do that physical movement of moving that through me and knowing only what I need for my own path moving forward is what I'm meant to sort of retain. Everything else is meant to wash right over me and to trust them with their experience and their journey and their path. Boy, Francesca, just when you just said that, I um, flashed right to my um, writing teacher, Ann Randolph, who actually has done a couple of things here. And she has a uh, usually a month long writing several times a year that some of the people from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she gave a discount to some of the people here to join us. And after every write, no matter what the prompt is or no matter what it's about, she has, as it ends, everybody gets up and she does what's called sound and movement, where you yell or scream or just whatever you need to do. Because when you're writing, you may not be aware of the emotions that are coming up. They may be unconscious, but then you go through the rest of your day with this. So we also taught that at the prison training, like when you have a death that's really hard or something that's really hard, go out to the garden and do kind of a sound and movement, release this from your body. 
because keeping it in the body, especially unattended is how trauma forms. And mm -hmm. so being able to physically move that energy and get it out of your system, I cannot believe how such a simple intervention works so incredibly well. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's, I think this may be the last question, um, but somebody has just asked Cindy, an uh, end of life doula from um, Ontario. Uh, I have a question supporting family or patients in crisis moments, for example, unmanaged symptoms, delirium or pain or a sudden bleed. Um, just curious what your approach might be Francesca, in those situations? Well, um, and it's tricky not knowing the circumstances. So if I were at the respite house, which is our local hospice house, then it would be different from if I am visiting somebody in their home. One emergency situation that I walked into was when I was showing up for a respite visit with a regular client and his partner had left, like there was going to be a brief window of time where she had left and I was coming and she made sure he was all set up and had what he needed and it, that was part of the plan. And so, but when I showed up, he had fallen. And so I came into the space, he was on the ground. He had been on the ground that time, that duration after she left. So for a period, it was very stressful for him. He was, he wasn't um, injured in terms of broken bones, but he certainly wasn't in a comfortable position. I wasn't sure at that point if he was injured. And so I did have to reach out and call for an assist. I had to contact the partner. I had to call for an assist, which our, our local emergency people will come and do. But mostly I had to keep myself and my own energy in check. I had to let yeah. him know, like, I'm here. I've got you. We've got this. I had to be really calm and reassuring, even though like my insides were, were jumping and I uh, had to take that breath, had to get recentered and had to trust myself enough that I could help see him through this time, even though it felt stressful and intense. And then we did. And then it was stressful and intense until it finally wasn't. Um, I think something like you know, an uncontrollable bleed. I mean, that is something that I, I honestly can't even imagine that for myself and hope that I would never have to face that myself as a doula or any person. I mean, that would be really difficult, really alarming, really stressful. Um, you know, we kind of do the best with what we have available. We're not medical care people unless you are acting in that capacity, which would be different. Yes. Sometimes I think it's usually that it's, it's to a lesser degree that there is pain or suffering, anxiety, something like that, or um, breathlessness, something that could be actually managed better, but the family members, the caregivers in the home just don't know that it could be managed better. They don't know that there are options available for that. So it's making sure that they know, okay, actually there's medication, there are interventions we can do some are medication, some are not even, you know, it could be turning a fan on toward the person that could help with some breathlessness. It could be a position change, but encouraging them to reach out to hospice probably more often than they know that they could, or that they, I don't want to say should, because I don't want to shit on people, but that they, they really can feel empowered to do that. And that's what hospice is there for. And they might not even realize that they might just sort of feel like, oh, I just thought that this is what we had to deal with. And this is the, you know, this is it. And yeah. so letting them know that there are interventions and options is really important, but always trying to stay calm in the time mm -hmm. of chaos. And sometimes it means calling 911 and then sitting with somebody while you wait for help. Yeah. And 911, like here in the United States, would be the emergency number. And if the person does not have advanced directives here in the United States, then 911 will do anything they can to resuscitate that person, which happened to one of our hospice volunteers quite by wasn't her intention and um, horrible for her husband because she died in the hospital and not at home. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the doctor that received them understood exactly what was happening and called the husband in and just said, you know, if this was my wife, this is probably what I would suggest you do. And they had some time together before she died. But I do, Sally put up, be careful about calling 911 um, if you don't know the status. But there are some situations where that might just have to be, I would always call the family caregiver, the family person, whoever you can first. 
The other thing about a bleed out, and if there's nurses or doctors here, please correct me on this, but my understanding when I trained hospice volunteers, if there's a patient that there's a possibility of a bleed out, that we would direct the volunteer or the family to put dark colored towels underneath the bed. And should that person start to bleed out, there's nothing you can do to reverse that once it starts. And usually the person is not aware that it's happening. Um, it's similar to dying in your sleep. It's just messier for the people observing it. But with, you just put the towels underneath. And we had one volunteer in all the 25 years I've trained, we've never had a volunteer on our services that had this experience. But one came from another hospice and did our training and said, oh, that's great because that's the first, that's the first volunteer. That's the first patient I saw. I'm like, what are you oh, talking wow. about? She walked in, remembered it from her training, looked under the bed. There were dark towels there, put them up and said, you know, I had to make a choice between calling the hospice or sitting with the person as they were dying. And I chose the person because I knew from what we heard, you can't do anything. You just could be the witness. So I just witnessed it. And then I called the hospice and then I called the caregiver and he was dead and they pronounced him. And then, um, I called my volunteer coordinator and she was so calm. She said, it's exactly what I was told could happen. So I think the educational part of this is really important and understanding when we can make a difference and when the difference is us being there and witnessing the situation that is happening and those persons yeah. last minutes or seconds. Right. And if we know in advance, I mean, how empowering is that to have an actual plan around it? Yes. And it will relieve that stress and anxiety. I mean, sometimes it will still be there but not in the same level as if it's completely unexpected and you're unprepared. Francesca, thank you so very much for today. And um, well, lots of beautiful comments about how helpful this has been to people. Um, we will have um, the recording. I'm gonna send the link to Ken Ross. He'll put it up on the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation's what YouTube. And then I'll send an email out to all of you who have registered. It will come out through Eventbrite. And uh, just so grateful for all of you being here today. And I look forward to the next time we're back. I think it probably won't be until sometime in October, at the end of October. We'll have don't, a... don't forget your donate button, dear. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, yes, I'm terrible, as is Ken Ross at this part. Um, and uh, here, we'll put it right up here for people who might be interested in this. I was stunned to listen to a beautiful podcast the other day with a colleague of mine was featured and the person just was like, oh, this is this is what we need. And so we're just going to ask you. And I was like, oh, that would be smart. So thank you, Francesca. Really beautiful work you're doing. And also, if you could, or I will look up the resource to include in the newsletter for people interested taking the doula training at the University of Vermont. Because they would Sure, I'll give you all the links that you'll need for things and one for an excerpt from the new book as well. That would be beautiful. Thanks so much. And so we're going to conclude this for all of you. Just a heads up. I'm going to um, turn off the recording, give it a beat. I will stay here for a moment. I don't know that Francesca can, but I will stay here for a couple of minutes if people want to wind down. But just give me a, a minute after we turn off the recording so everything remains um, quiet. Thank you so much for joining us. And this concludes our session with Francesca Arnoldy and her beautiful book. Um, living fully, dying prepared is the doula's guide to living fully and dying prepared. And we are going to turn off this recording without um, knocking this whole thing off. So thank you so much.